So under con- instructions of dear Gurudev and by his mercy, we continue today our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lida, Chapter 4, by Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, in the translation from Bengali, and with the commentary by Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. I don't see Ananda Prem, so we might be <clears throat> on our own today. Oh, there she is. Radhe Radhe Ananda Prem. So, uh, yeah, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, or as when someone in front of Radha Mohan caught, it would be great if you can send me for Japanese translation then. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. This chapter um, four of Adi Lila is, of course, a very special one. It's special to us because it's the it's a it's a pathway into the heart of God, the heart of Krishna. And already by uh, walking along that pathway into the heart of Krishna, we have an experience of, of the mercy of Krishna, who in taking appearance as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, opens his heart, opens his soul to us, lets us see how a God feels not just the mighty, magnificent, perfect, brilliant, powerful thing, powerful things that God does, but what a God feels. And just the fact that a God does feel and feels such tender emotions, feels such love, and, that sh- and shares this feeling with his devotees, becomes a servant to his devotees by showing his own feelings, by surrendering his feelings to them. This is the, this is the magic of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And this is what's happening in this chapter four. And this is the reason why Gurudev wanted us to, to study it carefully and meditate on it deeply. What is absolutely unique about the Gaudiya line, our line, Bhakti Yoga, is that it places the experience of love at the highest level. And that experience of love we know and we see and we read is made possible by Radharani by her appearance as the internal energy of Krishna and by her coming out, if you like, in the person of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So chapter four is the study of that passage into the heart of Krishna. And the more we read it, the more we see that as the story goes on in chapter four, Krishna is discovering himself. And he comes then at the late part of the chapter to the realization that he wants to relish this experience of loving God the way that his dear Radha does. He wants to enjoy that, have that pleasure. He wants to explore the emotions that she has. And she wants to see, he wants to see, like Radha, his loved one, 
experience the bliss. So he takes the position and the mood and, and, the, and the aspect, the color of Radha in order to fully experience Prem, fully experiencing loving God. Instead of the long story through Srimad Bhagavatam and, and, and elsewhere, where we have the devotees of Krishna adoring him because he's adorable, loving him deeply, and he experiences that love from the, the passive point of view. He gets to watch, but he has to watch others have an experience that he's never had, namely, loving God. And the miracle of Mahaprabhu is that he says, okay, now I want to be in the position of one who loves God. And the one who loves God the highest is Radha. So he takes her position. So this long chapter four, 270 verses or something, is the story of him going into his own heart and revealing to us what, is, what that is like. And we discussed before that chapter four is very important in relation to chapter three. Chapter four is the confidential reasons for, his, for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That means the internal reasons, the spiritual reasons, the soul reasons, why he for himself wanted to appear. And chapter three, which we might come back to another time, chapter three is the external reasons what he wanted to accomplish for his devotees. And there are two important lessons we've learned already about chapter three and chapter four together, when we think about them together. The first is that the combination of the internal reasons this desire to take the position of Radha and feel and experience what she experiences. And the external reasons, the desire to share Prema Bhakti with his devotees, give this experience to others. These two together are, they, they make for the ecstasy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They're just about too much. They make him blow up in terms of emotions. He wants to go deep into himself and at the same time give all that self to others. Explore and understand intimately what his own feelings of love for uh, the divine are and at the same time give these to the others, to, the, to his devotees. And this double experience causes what we call ecstasy. It's overflowing. It's too much for the body of a man. And so we have these ecstatic behavior that we read about in the, in the biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, where he's behaving wildly and endlessly blissfully and his body is changing and the color of his body is changing. He's dancing and he's chanting and he's because he has this double experience of going deep into himself and wanting to give of himself so generously. So it's this combination of the external consciousness that we have in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, mostly, but not always, in his, the early part of his life, when he's, a, when he's a simple devotee of Krishna, without really understanding deeply that he is also Krishna, and the later parts of his life, when he starts having visions about the Vrindavan Leela, starts dreaming about it, and then starts teaching it to the Goswamis. And all this life put together is what Rupa Goswami calls Abhideya. It's the method. It's the bhakti path going deep into the heart and discovering love 
and sharing it with others. Going deep into the heart and discovering that what our essence is, is to love God and then to come into relation with other people to, to share it. To go, lastly, to go deep into ourselves and discover that the, that the energy that drives us to want to love God is Radha. And that by, by developing our realization of Radha, we come closer to ourself and we come closer to the divine. Um, last time we had read verses 27 and up to half of 30. In verse 27 uh, and 28, which were together, Krishna was talking um, always through the, the pen of um, Krishna Das Kaviraj, but it's Krishna's thoughts or Krishna's voice that we're reading and hearing. And in that verse, 27, 28, he describes how he will appear as a pure devotee, a Shuddha Bhakta. He says, I will appear as a pure devotee. And this is, of course, what's remarkable about the early part of the life of Mahaprabhu, that he appears as the most humble devotee you can imagine, even while he's the champion of a Sanskrit scholarship. He's preaching in a way that inspires everyone and he's attracting the affections of everyone. All the same time he's being a devotee and he's a pure devotee of Krishna. So the first part of that verse says, I will appear as a pure devotee. And this is what we know he did. The second part of the verse said, in verse 28, that he would, Krishna would take part in wonderful pastimes. And then I hope you remember, it said, pastimes that will astonish me. And we spent some time talking about this. I won't repeat too much. But it was a very remarkable verse. I will participate in pastimes. And we know about these pastimes from history. And these pastimes will astonish me. They'll surprise me. I will be surprised by my own experience. Now, if we put this together with the verse from chapter 9 of Bhagavad Gita that Krishna cannot understand himself without the Radha, then we can begin to see that this is Radha emerging from the heart of Chaitanya. He's doing things he doesn't understand. He's doing things, his pastimes, that surprise him, that astonish him. And it's because he's becoming familiar with Radha, who's emerging from his heart, bringing the energy of his loving uh, devotion and surprising the opulent, all-powerful Krishna by the love within his own heart. He's being surprised by Prem. He's being surprised by the experience of love. And all this is happening through the, the pastimes. Both in part, the Rasa Lila, where he's dancing with the gopis, and very clearly through the Vrindavan Lilas, where he's, where he's um, having the amorous pastimes with, with Radha. So it's really quite a remarkable verse. Um, maybe one last remark about this surprise, because it's a reminder and an inspiration for us devotees, us simple devotees, that being surprised is a good thing. That knowing what's coming 
already having thought what is coming means in a way that it's already happened. Emotion flows from astonishment, from wonderment. We never became emotional about a mathematical equation because it's perfectly predictable. It follows all the laws, it follows all the rules. And if we only know the rules, then we are successful. But emotions, in particular love, break the rules, surprise us, astonish us. And that's how we know they are divine. Logic does nothing. Mathematical science only repeats what is already known. But love astonishes, love creates, love brings something new. So love is miraculous because it leads us out of the logic with which we want to master the world and which ends up only being a repetition of what we already know. And Radha is the energy that brings forth that love. So Radha is the energy of the divine, the energy of the growth of Prema, and, and the, the joy and satisfaction and bliss of Krishna. Verse 29 was about Yoga Maya. And this will come back again today when we continue. Yoga Maya is... It's called the energy, the internal energy of Krishna, which makes the um, transcendental activities of Krishna possible, which governs the transcendental activities. So sometimes we talk about maya alone. Maya is that energy which governs the illusion of material reality. Yoga Maya is the kind of energy that governs the transcendental Leelas of Krishna. And in verse 29, Krishna Das Kaviraj explained, or puts in the word in the mouth of Krishna to say that Yoga Maya, Maya in, inspires the gopis to leave their husbands and boyfriends and come to Krishna. So in the Rasa Lila, you remember, which is presented in Book 10 of Srimad Bhagavatam, where Krishna dances with all the gopis and expands himself into one Krishna for each gopi so that they all think that they are having a personal experience of Krishna. And through the Yoga Maya, they become attracted to him. And they become inspired to come to him in the, in the evening and dance under the moonlight. To break the rules of their social lives, to break the rules of their marriage and to dance with him. And to fall in love with him. Each and every one of the gopis falls in love with Krishna. This is Yoga Maya. It's the internal energy of Krishna that flows to the gopis and makes them forget their lives, makes them forget their material lives, makes them surrender that to the illusion that he is their husband a hundred thousand times over. And it leads them, Yoga Maya leads them to give all their admiration and their affection to, to Krishna. 
which gives him great pleasure and which is the first step both in what Gurudev calls Gopi Bhav or Gopi Consciousness, the understanding that we have a soul, that we are a soul, and that that soul is, is devotional, that is full of love. This is what the Rasa Lila shows us. The gopis come, they enter in a relationship with Krishna from soul to the divine, and that relationship is one of love. So Gopi Bhav is the realization that we have a soul and that that soul is loving. And it's also the Rasa Lila. It's the first step in Radha realization. Why? Because after the Rasa Lila, Krishna realizes that these gopis are giving him love and he begins to wonder what that is like. And he notices one gopi, Radha, who gives him enormous love. And he says, I've never given God enormous love. What can that be like? That story, which is fulfilled through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu later, begins with Gopi Bhav. So Gopi Bhav is the stepping stone to Manjari Bhav and Radha consciousness. We'll come back to this, but I just want to point out to you how important this Radha Lila is to awakening in Krishna himself the awareness that there is a higher level of loving which he has never experienced and which he will only experience through his Radha. Finally, last time we just started on the verse 30. And it continues this um, discussion of Rasalila. And it says something very sweet that we just started talking about last time and we'll continue. I'll remind you of the verse in the, in the translation. Prabhupada translate verse 30. Neither the gopis nor I shall notice this, for our minds will be always entranced by one another. What do they not notice? We talked last time that they don't notice that my yoga maya is making them fall in love with me. Why don't they notice? Because by entering into a, dev a devotional relationship with Krishna, they forget their material lives. They forget their material consciousness. They go into their souls. They establish a soul relationship with Krishna. They, under, they establish a relation of love and admiration for Krishna. And when that happens, they forget that they are material beings. They forget that they have homes. They, lift, they forget that they left the milk cooking on the stove and they ran out to see Krishna. They forget that they're married or have boyfriends or children. They don't know what's going on. They are driven by their love, which itself is governed by, we said, yoga, yoga maya. But more important maybe is that your, uh, Krishna doesn't know what's going on either. He says, neither the gopis nor I shall notice this, for our minds will always be entranced by one another's beauty and quality. So this, the discovery that Krishna is making that he is that he loses himself too. He surrenders to the, the love of the, the devotees also. And this is the step that is going to lead him to take the position of Radharani in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there was one comment of Prabhupada last time that we should remember, and that was that this, I'll read for you. The Lord desires to show these affairs to the devotees of the world. 
In other words, the reason uh, Srimad Bhagavatam presents this Leela is because Krishna wants the world to see what devotional love is. He wants to communicate about what devotional love is. And this is going to be later in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one of the main reasons for his appearance. So devotional love doesn't mean grabbing and taking. <laughs> I love you, I want you, come here. It means letting the gopis come to us. It makes, means letting the love come to us. It means living in a kind of consciousness of openness which has no calculation, no science, which draws its power and its strength and its happiness from the astonishment. Now we continue with the Prabhupada's commentary and he turns his attention to this idea of parakya which is so very important for us. In Bhagavad Gita class, we talked about this, this idea a bit. Parakya means belonging to another. Para and kia. Para means for something else and kia another. So, in a first meaning, in the first meaning of parakya, it, we can understand that it means that the one you're with belongs to someone else. Such as a, a love affair outside of a marriage, a love affair with someone who's already married to someone else. But we come to see that we shouldn't be too quick in understanding the other as the husband back at home. Because we can also understand parakia to mean belonging to another, a relationship with someone who belongs to another, and that other is the divine, is God. So parakia, we usually mean, oh, that means you're having a, a love affair with a married woman. But on a spiritual level, we can understand it to mean you're having a, a love with someone whose, love, whose heart be belongs already to God, whose heart is already divine. You're having a relationship with the divine, which means that your love is a very pure one. We've said many times that, and Prabhupada says, and uh, Krishna Das uh, Kaviraj says, that all love is at the root, prema, but it's covered up and confused and forgotten. So all love is essentially pure love, which is covered. All love is prema, which has not been purified, which has not been realized which has not been uncovered. So the parakya ras, which is mentioned in the verse, which is what these Krishna and the gopis are experiencing because the gopis are married, it can also mean the emotion that is released when we realize that our love is love for the divine, that our love is not or not only for our beloved, it's the realization that happens when I look into the eyes of my wife and I see my beautiful wife and I see the divine in her eyes. That is also parakya bhav. I see that my love is for another and that other is 
the divine. And when we see that, when we see the energy of the divine in the one we love in a mundane way, then we see Radharani speaking to us, reaching out to us from the soul of that person, reaching out to us and asking that we purify our soul so that she can be fully realized. So parakiyaras are the emotions that are released when we realize that I don't just love her because she has beautiful eyes. I love her for something more, something which maybe I don't even understand yet. And this is what happens to Krishna in the Rasa dance. He says, I don't understand my emotions for these gopis. And what lets him understand it is the appearance uh, of Radha. Radha is the energy of divine pleasure, divine love, Ladani Shakti. And when we realize that our, the love we feel for a mundane lover is more than the body and the mind of that lover, reaches more deeply into her or him and reaches more deeply into us, what we're feeling is that energy of Radha. And that energy of Radha is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wants to feel completely, and it does de- indeed it does feel completely. That's the miracle of his life. Prabhupada explains now in the, in the following comments the difference between spiritual love and material love. Really simply, we could say spiritual love is love for the soul of the other, from the soul of ourselves. And material love is love for the physical beauty, the intellectual beauty, um, the experiences we've had from the same place in myself. And so if we want to talk about being unfaithful, like the old-fashioned way of talking about Paraki above, when we're unfaithful in material love, then we're simply spending time with someone who is already promised to another. But when we're unfaithful in a spiritual sense, we are denying or avoiding the depth of the spiritual love we have for the other. We're not being loyal to our own souls and we're not being loyal to the soul of the other. (coughs) Let's let Prabhupada speak now. He puts it this way in the commentary. It is something like the attraction of a married woman for a man other than her husband. Parakirasa, he's talking about Parakirasa. In the material world, this sort of relationship is most abominable, terrible, because it is a perverted reflection of the Parakiras of the spiritual world, where it is the highest kind of loving affair. This must be a very strange thing to say for most of us. Let's read again. In the material world, this sort of relationship, one based on Pariki above, is most abominable, most terrible. Because, but, but now listen, not because it's against the rules of marriage, but because it's 
against the rules of the heart, of the soul. Listen, he says it's most terrible because it is a perverted reflection of the parakiras in the spiritual world, where it is the highest kind of loving affair. So parakia bhav or parakia ras, as, he, as it's called in the verse, it's not bad because it's breaking marriage rules. It's bad because it's ignorant of the soul. It's foolish about the reality of the soul as love. It's foolish about prem. So parakiras in the spiritual world is not the love of a material other, another guy. It's the love of another soul, the divine. Uh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada continues, such feelings between the devotee and the Lord are presented by the influence of Yogamaya. In other words, this internal energy of Krishna, the Yogamaya, is what organizes and governs things so that these feelings can come out. It's the spiritual energy that is the orchestra director for relationships of the heart. And this means something like Yoga Maya, this internal spiritual energy of Krishna, is what allows this love of the gopis to come out in the way it does. Without any um, social chains, without any moral chains, not without any legal chains, only coming right from the heart. It means letting love come out in wisdom. It means letting love come out in the understanding that pure love is. Spiritual love, which is Gopi Bhav, but more than that in Manjari Bhav, that pure love is Radha's love. The purest love is Radha's love for, 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 for Moha. So let's be sure we're not lacking love, are we, in our lives? Or we're not lacking what we think is love. But we are lacking realized love. We're lacking realization that all love begins with the divine and ends through the power of Radharani, through love for the divine. And all the rest, from beginning to end, is flowing through our souls, taking shape in our material bodies and in our spiritual forms, all with the purpose of seeing the highest love, the love of Radha for her Mohan, become realized. And that's what we see when we read the only true love is realized love. And realized love means understanding where it's coming from and where it's going and what our task is in it. And that task is to make it flow. And in particular, our bhakti tradition we carry out that task by serving Radha in her in her um, in her desire to give perfect love to Mohan. Now Prabhupada comes and gives us a new concept. He says the Bhagavad Gita states that devotees of the highest grade 
are under the care of Daiva Maya or Yoga Maya. Daiva means divine, so divine Maya, Yoga Maya. So it's another concept for this Yoga Maya, which is the energy of Krishna, which is used to organize his transcendental activities. And that's what Prabhupada says is also Daiva Maya. Daiva Maya is a, is a word from the verse. And then he cites the verse from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 13. And the verse is uh, wonderful. You might remember it if you read together with me, chapter 9. Mahatmanas tu mam partha davivam pakritam ashritaha. Great souls, Mahatmanas, indeed, Arjuna, take shelter in Yoga Maya, in the divine nature, in the Daiva Maya. So the greatest soul is the one that knows to surrender the most to the divine energy. Um, that was my translation, if you like, but here's Prabhupada's translation from Bhagavad Gita. He says, those who are actually great souls, Mahatma, uh, Mahatmas, are fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, always engaged in the service of the Lord. So instead of translating Yoga Maya as divine nature, he says, those fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness engaged in the service of the Lord. And this means, it's very important, that Prabhupada believes that Krishna consciousness is service, is the mood of service, is surrender to devotion, to bhakti. And these, he says, are under the care of Daivi Pakriti, Yoga Maya, divine nature. So the highest a devotee can be for Prabhupada is to be in service. That's why he's a bhakta, Prabhupada. And the best way for the divine leelas of Krishna to work, for the yoga maya of Krishna to do its job, is for us to serve in full devotion. That's what I meant when I said a moment ago, that is our task to serve in devotion to Radha Mohan by serving in devotion to Radha, knowing that Radha's goal is the love of Mohan. The final comment on this point from Prabhupada, Yoga Maya creates a situation in which the devotee is prepared to transgress all regulative principles simply to love Krishna. It's, it's repeating what we said before, that the internal energy of Krishna organizes things so that the gopis will come and give their love to Krishna. It's Yoga Maya that governs the Rasa Lila. It's Yoga Maya which creates the loving and the longing in the hearts of the gopis. Or I'm, I'm wrong to say creates, it reveals it, it releases that love. It makes love a practice. And on the side of Krishna, it introduces Krishna to the possibilities of love. The Rasa Lila plants in the heart of Krishna the idea that loving God can be higher than God. That the love for Radha for Mohan can be higher than Radha or Mohan. And this is what he seeks to realize in his appearance as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
So yoga maya is that energy, the energy of parakiras. It, it transforms obstacles into longing. And we'll come back to this in a moment, but because it's very deep and very important. But to put it simply, yoga maya is what makes the obstacles of the gopis, their husbands, their cooking, their children, their house, all those obstacles, it makes them turn into longing. It takes them from their material lives, the cooking milk on the stove, and it puts them down into their souls so they can feel it as love for Krishna in their souls. All those obstacles become the engines, the gasoline, the benzene for longing. And by doing that, it reveals that there's something higher in their hearts. And that is the, the love they have for Krishna. So the Rasa Lila is, um, is the highest moment of soul consciousness. What, Gopi, what uh, Gurudev calls Gopi Bhav. It's the moment of relation between a soul, a gopi soul, and the divine. And the moment when they forget their material lives, their material consciousness, and become pure love for Krishna. And the, and the message of the Rasa Lila is that <coughs> the, the highest relation we can have to God is through the devotion in our souls. Gopi Bhav means, I am a soul, and that soul is love. And like I said, this prepares the way for the appearance of Radha. It points the way to the Nikunj Lila, to the pastimes in the forest of Vrindavan, the amorous pastimes. Like I said, Parakya Bhav, in material consciousness is, is the husband and the family. That's the other, the true love. But in spiritual consciousness, and now the gopis have spiritual consciousness, in spiritual consciousness, the true love is the force that gives love, divine love, Radha. Prabhupada continues, a devotee naturally does not like to transgress the laws of reverence for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But by the influence of Yoga Maya, he is prepared to do anything to love the Supreme Lord better. So for bhaktas like us, for Gaudiyas like us, Love is greater than reverence for the laws. We transcend reverence in order to, mm, to live the love that's true in our heart. There's nothing bad, there's nothing immoral, there's nothing painful, there's nothing illegal. There's no police coming for, to take you for what you did with your heart. It's the realization. It's not saying, I want to be a criminal and break the law. It's saying, I realize that love is higher than law. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada again, those under the spell of the material energy cannot at all appreciate the activities of Yoga Maya. For a conditioned soul, can hardly understand the pure reciprocation, the pure exchange between the Lord and his devotee. So someone who's conditioned means someone who's completely in material consciousness. Mm -hmm. <coughs> someone who's completely under the influence of Maya. And they don't... Can you hear me? Yes. Um... 
I want to share something, and it's also it's also a question. You said thank you for your explanation first, <laughs> and you said that Yoga Maya creates obstacles for the gopis to increase their longings, <clears throat> and it came to me the obstacles obstacles in my life. Sometimes I don't know if every time, but sometimes they are maybe there to increase my longing to to my longing to Radha Mahan. Not for to run away from this life, but to see wow what my the the material love is not the real love. It's not the true true love. There is much more and it increases my longing also to come closer to to Swamini and closer to Bhakta. What do you think about this? The best way to think about these kinds of life challenges. is to step back. To step back one step and look from a bird's eye at your, at your life. And when we do that, things that we thought were accidents seem a bit more necessary. Things that we thought were Obstacles seem a bit more useful. And things that we thought were challenging us seem suddenly to have helped us. What's beautiful about the word obstacle or about the idea of obstacle is that It's one time, it's punctual. It's like the crack of a whip. It never remains. An obstacle never remains. It appears and then in one way or another, it disappears. We don't know how or why, we sometimes never know why, But an obstacle that is permanent is not an obstacle. It's called life. An obstacle is something that goes away. No problem ever remains a problem. It always becomes something else. The world was not created a problem. It was created into some form which is finding its way to perfection and everything that happens is on the path to that perfection. And when we take the bird's eye view, sometimes we can see the role that our obstacle played in our path towards the perfection. Sometimes we need to leave, live a whole lifetime in order to look back and see the role it played in the perfection of our lives. But the default position of the world is love. The world is made good. And any bad that we experience is temporary. Now, when you're Krishna and you live five million years, temporary can be quite long. So it's hard for us sometimes to see. But the world is created by the personality of Godhead whose heart is made of love. And it's the leelas of love, that, of love that are happening in our lives now, even in the darkest moments. This is why some faith is good. This is why some humor is good. <laughs> A bit of irony is good. And sometimes we even need some courage. Obstacles 
to summarize, obstacles never stay obstacles. They become something else. That, and that I think, I think, I hope that I'm explaining what Prabhupada said when I'm trying to answer your question. So I'm going to read this comment again, if you like. Those under the spell of material energy cannot at all appreciate the activities of Yoga Maya. So, in other words, to put it in my words, or no, to put it in your words, better, those under the spell of, spell of material energy think that an obstacle is the whole world. Because they don't understand that Yoga Maya is putting the obstacle there in order to steer you in your life. And then Prabhupada says, for a conditioned soul, because a conditioned soul can hardly understand the pure reciprocation between the Lord and his devotee. So the pure exchange. Again, for the material, for the person in material consciousness, we cannot understand how that obstacle is leading us to a union in love with the divine. We cannot understand the relationship between the devotee and the Lord. But this is because of our conditioning. Not because the world is evil or because God is evil, but our conditioning makes us think and see in a very conditioned way, a narrow way. And by becoming unconditioned through our spiritual practice, we can see and understand more clearly the meaning of everything that pops up as an obstacle in our lives. And one last thing, I say it many times, but I, I hope it inspires some people that it's never a, when an obstacle appears, it's not, it cannot be a question of getting a big hammer and breaking the obstacle, being strong and fighting the obstacle, or bringing some fire and burning the obstacle. That is what a conditioned soul does. A, a, a realized and evolving soul says, let me more deeply understand my life and my relation to God in order to understand the nature of this obstacle. So it's not a matter of saying no to the obstacle. It's a matter of saying yes to the obstacle without understanding it. There, I, I stop it. So it's a very personal point to me because that's, it's, it's, it's a question for my life too, which is why I'm sorry to talk so much about it, but we'll, we'll continue a little bit now. And I think- Thank you, my dear. Okay. Thank you very much. It helps me and some t things I can hear, I have to hear it again and again and again. Jay Dadi, Jay Purudu, Jay Udava. Thank you, my dear. Okay. I'm seeing the time actually and I, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm on European time. We have a half an hour still. So, where were we? Um, okay, to finish this point, I want to bring it back to Gopi Bhav and Manjuri Bhav, since this is such an important matter for us. The first, it's two steps. In Manjari, in, in Manjari realization. The first step is soul realization, understanding that we are souls and that that soul has a relation to the divine and that that's, that relation is one of love. First step, three points. Soul, relation, love. This is Gopi Path. And if we master this in one lifetime, we are 
geniuses. We are wonderful. If we understand that any relation I have, from the highest relation to my Gurudev, to a low relation to my taxi driver, the only thing that's the glue in that relation is my emotion, my love. Even a stranger on the street, if I see it as a human being, there's a relation and there's love, even if only a tiny bit of love. There is no relation which is not love. And then the greatest relation, the relation to God, is of course the greatest love. This is Gopi Bhav. Then the next step toward Manjari Bhav is the realization that God itself is loving. First step, our relation to God is love. Second step, God itself is loving. That the desire of God is to love, that the reality of God is to love, and that in order to realize this fact, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears in the mood and the shape of the lover of God and gives the possibility for God to reveal himself as lover, as loving. And to reveal that the natural form of God is not to be a king on a throne. The natural form of God is to be humble, to be a devotee, to be loving, to be, to be, to be longing. Who does God love? Who is uh, God the devotee to? to? To whom is God a devotee? God is the lover of God in the form of Radha. And God is the beloved of God in the form of Mohan. These two together, in this beautiful relationship that's revealed to us in the body and activities of uh, Mahaprabhu, is the, the reality that the highest thing in the world is love is the love that's given from God to God. There's nothing greater, there's nothing imaginable than that love that Radha gives to Mohan and seeks to give ev uh, continuously. She never gives enough. She always wants to give more and he always wants to have more. And these realizations eventually come to us through what is called Yoga Maya. Now Prabhupada takes the next step and talks a bit more about the Vaidhi problem, the problem of regulative principles. He says this, by executing devotional service under the regulative principles, one can become very highly elevated and then begin to appreciate the dealings of pure love under the management of Yoga Maya. This is the kind of thing we've we heard before in, in Bhagavad Gita, that there's no there's nothing wrong in following regulative principles, they can lead us quite far. So if we if we do our uh, do our chanting as prescribed, as, as if we do our our devotions in temple, if we do our devotions at home. These can lift our soul very far and purify our soul very far. But the final step is not possible without a surrender to the energy of God, without a surrender to Yoga Maya. So there's, in material consciousness we go very far, in regulative consciousness if you like, but, it, but at some stage we, we experience the realization that all these material activities have a true spiritual meaning, that our material consciousness of our existence passes into a spiritual consciousness of our existence. And a reminder that the two are not 
completely separated, even though they see the world in completely different ways. Material consciousness and spiritual consciousness are both created by, by the Creator. But they permit us to see different things and they help us along the path at different moments and on different levels. So we can, we can see a flower in the garden and we can find it beautiful with our material eyes, with our material consciousness. But that beauty we see in it, we see because of its material qualities. The splendid color, the splendid fragrance, the splendid um, shape. That same flower seen with spiritual eyes is seen according to its spiritual qualities, according to the divine within it, the divine flavor within it. So there's not a spiritual flower and a material flower. There is material consciousness and spiritual consciousness. Both the material and the spiritual are, are governed by Krishna. The material um, world is governed by Maya Shakti, which is Krishna's, and the spiritual world is governed by Yoga Maya, which is Krishna's too, but transcendental. They all arise from Krishna, they all serve Krishna, and they both make sure that we are in the correct relationship to our material and spiritual consciousness at the right time and in the right place. That our attachments to material consciousness are just the right strength for the the little nudge forward that we need. Just in the right place to give us the inspiration to have faith and just in the right place to give us the material duties to make sure we go to temple even when we don't have faith so that we'll be there when the moment of faith comes. So just like the obstacles I was saying to Rasheshwari a moment ago, it's not material reality is not our enemy. It's not something to battle against in a war. Material reality is something to realize. It's not to destroy material reality like with a big uh, bomb. It's to understand the, the role it plays in our spiritual life. So a realized person doesn't see a different flower than we do. A realized person sees the same flower in a spiritual way. Now Prabhupada again, by the influence of such forgetfulness, Prabhupada, this guy skipped a line, I'm afraid, I'm sorry about that. Prabhupada says, in the spiritual loving sentiment, induced by Yogamaya potency, caused by Yogamaya energy, both Lord Sri Krishna and the damsels of Raj forget themselves in spiritual rapture. So he repeats a little bit, but it's a very good point. The Yogamaya doesn't destroy their material connections, doesn't burn their houses and kidnap their children and take away their husbands. No, yoga maya makes them forget these material bonds so that they can go deep in their spiritual devotion to Krishna. It changes their consciousness. They, the gopis don't say no to the material life. They just forget it. They don't, they realize they, they have no relation to, to it anymore. It's not there for them. It's not a struggle. If you're struggling... If you come home from temple and your jaw is tired from biting your teeth together, then you know you're not quite in the right practice. Transcending material experience is softness. It's surrender. 
It's letting the truth come, not making it come. So now I come to that line I jumped, I jumped to, I was too quick to jump to. Prabhupada is commenting, by the influence of such forgetfulness of the gopis, the attractive beauty of the gopis plays a prominent part in the transcendental satisfaction of the Lord, who has nothing to do with mundane, who has nothing to do with mundane sex. So if the gopis were there in the forest and had one thought on their husband and the burning milk on the stove, they wouldn't be able to reach into their hearts and feel that love for the divine. So it's through this forgetfulness that Krishna has, or the, the yoga maya of Krishna, has made it possible for them to be part of the satisfaction of, of Krishna, of the, the pleasure of Krishna, which comes through being loved by them. And again, this love, he repeats, but it has nothing to do with material love. He continues, because spiritual love of Godhead is above everything mundane, the gopis superficially seem to transgress the codes of mundane morality. But here it's important to stand when he understand when he says transgress, he does not mean break. It seems like they're breaking the rules, but they're not breaking the rules. They're transcending the rules. They're living in a consciousness where these rules have no meaning. Because their love for God cannot be governed by social rules about marriage and about dinner time and about the kids. If we see the gopis in material consciousness, then they look like they're breaking the rules. Just like we could see a, a friend of ours who's... Uh, who's cheating on the, on, the, on the husband or on the wife. You say, oh, that's no good. That's not, that's not respectful. That's not the rules. But it's only if we see it in material consciousness, the marriage vows, the, the violation, the morality and all this. But the gopis see in spiritual consciousness, thank you, thanks to the yoga maya. And therefore, we see, when we see spiritually, we see only their devotion. It's again, it's not about what they do. It's not about the rules. It's about our consciousness of what we experience, or what we see. This, Prabhupada, um, there we are, pardon me. This perpetually puzzles mundane moralists. So the people who want to say, you're good, you're bad, you're moral, you're immoral, they don't understand this, says Prabhupada. Therefore, he goes on, Yoga Maya acts to cover the Lord and his pastimes from the eyes of mundaners, the ones in material consciousness, as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 7, verse 25, where the Lord says that he reserves the right of not being exposed to everyone. So this is a new development to what we've already said. The verse seven, uh, 25 from Bhagavad Gita, I'll just say the English. I, it's Krishna speaking, I am never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent. So that actually says, Savasya, I am manifest, I am manifest, I am never manifest to everyone, he says. For them, I am covered by my internal potency, my yoga maya, and therefore they do not know that I am unborn and infallible. Avyayam, which really means imperishable, avyayam. So in other words, it's not such a big problem that you and I look at them with moral eyes because Krishna's uh, yoga maya is going to cover our eyes anyway so we don't see them. So 
So he says, I don't even let the foolish and the unintelligent, the ones in material consciousness, I don't even let them see me. So don't worry. It's not a problem they don't understand. They don't understand the, the um, transcendental nature of the rasa lila because they're not going to even see it. You already have to have some spiritual consciousness in order to even see it at all. And this reminds us of the wonderful, almost all of chapter 10 of Bhagavad Gita, where um, Arjuna begs Krishna to show himself completely, and then Krishna does re reveal himself. He lets, he, he takes away the yoga maya, which is blocking Arjuna's eyes, and lets him see him. And of course, as you remember, Arjuna is absolutely terrified by the experience. So this is not visible to everyone. So all these problems of morality are not such big problems because people who don't have the right eyes don't see it anyway. He goes on, Prabhupada, saying that the acts of Yoga Maya make it possible for the Lord and the gopis in loving ecstasy to sometimes meet and sometimes separate. So the Rasarita. Remember, the gopis are individual souls, atma, countless, endless individual souls who understand themselves as souls and therefore can freely love the soul of God, can love from their souls and understand that love, a God is love and receives their own love. They are soul realized which is not everything, but again, it's the big first step for us on our path to bhakti. Uh, Shira Prabhupada repeats himself a little bit now and says, these transcendental loving affairs of the Lord are unimaginable to empiricists, means people in material consciousness. Unimaginable to empiricists involved in the impersonal feature of the absolute truth. So an impersonalist, we, speak, we spoke a lot about this in Bhagavad Gita class too, an impersonalist is one who does not believe that God has a personality. An impersonalist is someone who believes that God is simple, silent, lifeless, uh, unchanging reality quite magnificent and quite real and quite beautiful, but nonetheless, it's not acting, it's not receiving action, and so on. So someone like that cannot even imagine the Rasa cannot imagine an individual soul like a gopi having a relationship of devotion to the Paramatma, the soul, which is the super soul, which is God. These people, the impersonalists, the Maya Vedas, they don't understand. They don't understand devotion, the soul, relation, or God at all, according to, to Srila Prabhupada. Therefore, Prabhupada continues, the Lord himself appears before the mundaners, the ones in material consciousness, to bestow upon them the highest form of spiritual realization and also personally relish its essence. So there are two things, diff quite different and very important to understand the difference. Now he's talking about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he says, the Lord comes to give spiritual realization, Gopi Bhav, and secondly, to personally relish its essence, Manjari Bhav, to personally have the experience of its essence, which is Radha, to personally take the form and appear in the mood of Manjari, appear in the mood of someone relishing the relishing of God. So just in this little sentence by Prabhupada, there's a great, a very big uh, statement coming. 
Not everyone can see this. Not everyone can imagine it. And that is why he comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That is his gift. Because of the Yoga Maya, it's not possible to understand. He wants everyone to have this, everyone to understand. He wants to give to these mundaners, he calls them, the people with material consciousness. He wants to give to them both this Gopi Bhav and the Manjari Bhav. And this is exactly what uh, Mahaprabhu does. He teaches us that we have a soul, a soul that is loving, that it's a relation to God. And then he says, this is so great, having a soul and being, it being loving, that I'm going to enjoy it with you. Come on, let's enjoy it together. I'm going to come in the mood of Radha, who's the essence of this love, and I'm going to relish it together with you. I'm going to be a devotee like you, a devotee of Radha, and we'll do this together, we'll discover it together. That's the immense generosity of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Both understanding who we are and understanding that this means giving that same happiness to others. What is the name of giving happiness to others? Latani Shakti. Pleasure giving energy. The force that gives happiness to others. This is what our Radha embodies. And this is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embodies by making his appearance in that way. Devotion, yes, but even better, devotion given by God. Devotion, Gopi Bhav, devotion given by God, Manjari Bhav. And so Prabhupada continues, the Lord is so merciful that he himself descends to take the fallen soul back home to the kingdom of Godhead, where the erotic principles of Godhead are eternally relished in their real form, distinct from the perverted sexual love so much adored and indulged in by the fallen souls in their diseased condition. Now, with respect to Prabhupada, I don't like this word fallen and fallen souls because this is material morality in my mind, but this is in my humble opinion. And Prabhupada is great and he has written this. I think what fallen souls means is souls who have forgotten that they are souls. A fallen soul is a soul who's not fully realized that she is a soul and someone who's not fully realized that she's a soul, then wastes time in, in material pursuits. So I don't want to believe, and I might be wrong again in, in all humility, I don't want to believe that there's a kind of Old Testament idea here that there are people who were good and now they're bad by essence, and we can pick them up again. I much more have a f f strong feeling that people uh, lose um, sight of their goodness, lose sight of their, their purity, lose sight of their divinity. So there's nothing at all like this Old Testament idea that a, uh, a, a Christian is born a sinner and must save herself from that. Like the Old Testament says, we're all born sick because we're in the family of Adam, who took the apple that was forbidden. You know the story. You Christians know the story. We're all sick and we need to fix ourselves. No, this is not what Bhakti says to me. That we become confused, we become covered, we become foolish, but we are fundamentally good. Now Prabhupada says, and we're coming to the end of the commentary, the reason the Lord displays the Rasalila is essentially to induce all the fallen souls to give up their diseased morality and religiosity and to attract them to the king of God, kingdom of God to enjoy the reality. So if I put it in the terms that I prefer, 
humbly, respectfully, I would say the purpose of the Rasa Lila is to remind the fallen souls of their goodness and to remind them of the love in their hearts and that the blockages of religious Vaidhi practice will stop them from finding their way to an authentic relationship with uh, God. Srila Prabhupada, a person who actually understands what the Rasa Lila is, will certainly hate to indulge in mundane sex life. For the realized soul, hearing the Lord's Rasa Lila through the proper channel will result in complete abstinence from material sexual pleasure. <coughs> Again, this is fine, but I think it's not a matter of creating the willpower to not do what we want to do, to not seek material pleasures when that's what we really want to do, because willpower is material. Willpower is, is in our minds. If we surrender, however, to soul power, we will become interested in much different pleasures, and those are the pleasures of the heart. So the devotee is not an Vaidhi devotee. The, the devotee does not stop material pursuits out of fear or because she thinks it's wrong or because her mother yelled at her. She stops because it's not interesting anymore. Nothing about willpower or strength of character or, or strength of intelligence will help us. In fact, it's by surrendering to what we think is strength that we'll find our way to the softness of our, our hearts. And material pleasure won't disappear, it will just be forgotten. Just like the gopis in the Rasa Lila forget it so that they can find their way to their own hearts and establish a relation to Krishna, which is loving, and by doing so, they reveal to Krishna what he wants to do. I think the gopis deserve lots of praise because it's the Rasa Lila which inspires Krishna to, under, to want to understand what that's like to love God. <laughs> and that's what leads him to the realization that taking the form of Rasa, he too can share that. He too can understand that. So the gopis deserve lots of veneration and praise, I think. And here we stop. That completes the commentary of Prabhupada, verse 30 of Adilila, chapter 4.